what's also very important to us, our innate morality. If there's one point that I get made more than another to me when I go and debate religious people, it's this. They say, where would your morals come from if there was no God? It's actually, it's a question that's posed in, in uh, Dostoevsky's wonderful novel, The Brothers Karamazov. One of the, one of the brothers says, uh, it's Smerdyakov actually, the wicked one, says it. Um, if God is dead, isn't everything permitted? Isn't everything permissible? Uh, where would our ethics be if there was no superintending deity? This again seems to me a very profound insult to us in our very deepest nature and character. It is not the case, I submit to you, that we do not set about butchering and raping and thieving from each other right now uh, only because we're afraid of a divine punishment or because we're looking for a divine reward. It's an extraordinarily base and insulting thing to say to people. Um, on my mother's side, some of my ancestry is Jewish. I don't happen to believe the story of Moses in Egypt or the exile or the wandering in the Sinai. And in fact, now even Israeli archaeology has shown that there isn't a word of truth to that story or really any of the others. But take it to be true. Am I expected to believe that my mother's ancestors got all the way to Mount Sinai, quite a trek, under the impression until they got there that rape, murder, perjury and theft were okay? Only to be told when they got to the foot of Mount Sinai, bad news, none of these things is kosher after all. <laughs> They're all forbidden. No, I don't think so. I think, I think we, can, we can actually have a better explanation in every sense. Superior as well as better, that no one would have been able to get as far as Mount Sinai or in any other mountain in any other direction unless they had known that human solidarity demands that we look upon each other as brothers and sisters and that we forbid activities such as murder, a rape, a perjury, and theft, that this is innate in us. Of those to whom it is not innate, the sociopaths who don't understand the needs of anyone but themselves and the psychopaths who positively take pleasure in breaking these rules, well, all we can say is, um, they, according to one theory, they're also made in the image of God, which makes the image of God question rather problematic, does it not? Or that they can be explained by further and better research and have to be restrained and disciplined meanwhile. But in no sense here is religion a help where it claims to help most, which is to our morality, to uh, ethics. Uh, finally, I would say, uh, not finally because I'm finished yet, I'm not quite done, don't relax. I hope everyone's got a drink, something to eat. Um, but of, of the, uh, on the poison question, I think uh, there's the real temptation of something very poisonous to human society and human relations, uh, which is the fear of freedom. <coughs> the wish to be slaves, the wish to be told what to do. Now, just as we all like to think, and we live under written documents and proclamations that encourage us to think that it is our birthright and our, our, our most precious need to be free, to be liberated, to be untrammeled, so we also know that unfortunately the, the innate in people is the servile, is the wish to be told what to do, is the adoration for strong and brutal and cruel uh, leaders, that uh, th this other baser element of the human makeup has to be accounted for and gives us a great deal of trouble around the world as we speak. Religion, in my view, is a reification, a distillation of this wish to be a serf, to be a slave. Ask yourself if you really wish it was true that there was a celestial dictatorship that watched over you from the moment you were born, actually the moment you were conceived, all through life, night and day, knew your thoughts, waking and sleeping, uh, could, could in fact convict you of thought crime, the absolute, uh, the absolute definition of a, of a dictatorship, can convict you for what you think, and what you privately want, what you're talking about to yourself, that monitors you like this, under permanent surveillance control, and supervision and doesn't even let go of you when you're dead because that's when the real fun begins <laughs> now my question is this I my question to you is this who wishes that that were true who wants to lead the life of a surf in a celestial North Korea I've been to North Korea I'm one of the very few writers who has I, I'm indeed the, the only writer who's been to all three axes of evil countries Iran Iraq and, and, and North Korea and I can tell you North Korea it's the most religious state I've ever been to. I used to wonder when I was a kid, what would it be like praising God and thanking him all day and all night? Well, now I know. 
because North Korea is a completely worshipful state. It's set up only to do that for adoration. And it's only one short of a trinity. They have a father and a son, as you know, the dear leader and the great leader. The, the father is still the president of the country. He's been dead for 15 years. But uh, the Kim Jong-il, the little one, is only the head of the party and the army. His father is still the president, head of the state. So you have in North Korea what you might call a necrocracy. <laughs> or uh, what I, also, I, I call a mausolocracy, or a thanatocracy. One, just one short of a trinity. Father, son, maybe no Holy Ghost, but they do say that when the birth of the younger one took place, the birds of Korea sang in Korean to mark the occasion. This I've checked. It did not happen. <laughs> Take my word for it. Uh, didn't occur. And I suppose I should add that they don't threaten to follow you after you're dead. You can leave North Korea. You can get out of their hell and their paradise by dying. Out of the Christian and Muslim one, you cannot. Now, this is the wish to be a slave. And in my view, it, it poisons uh, human relations. Now, I've I've already babbled for nearly 20 minutes. I'll be quick. Um, it is argued, well, some religious people have done great things and have been motivated to do so by their faith. The most cited case in point I have found is that of Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King, who I know I don't need to explain to you about. Two quick things on that. First, he was its true minister. Um, and he did preach the book of Exodus, the exile of an enslaved and, and oppressed people, as his metaphor. But if he, if he really meant it, he would have said that the oppressed people, as the book of Exodus finds them doing, uh, were entitled to kill anyone who stood in their way and take their land, their property, enslave their women, uh, kill their children, and uh, commit a genocide, uh, rape, ethnic cleansing, and uh, forcible threat, theft of land. That's what... The book of Exodus describes happening, the, uh, the full destruction of other tribes. It's very fortunate that Dr. King only meant the Bible at the most to be used as a metaphor. And after all, he was using the only book that he could be sure all of his audience had ever really read. That's the first thing. The second is, during his lifetime, he was attacked all the time for having too many secular and leftist and non-believing friends. The people like famous black secularists like Bayard Rustin, uh, A. Philip Randolph and others, the men who actually did organize the march on Washington, which leads me to my third observation, which is this. It's a challenge I've made now in debates with rabbis, with priests of all Christian stripes, with imams, um, once with a, I know this sounds like the opening of a joke about some bar, but once also with a Buddhist nun um, in, in Miami. I asked them all, here's my, here's my challenge. You have to name me an ethical statement that was made or a moral action that was performed by a religious person in the name of faith that could not have been made as an action or uttered as a statement by non, a person not of faith, a person of no faith. You have to do that. Not so far, and I've done it at quite a high level with the religious, no takers. No one's been able to find me that. That being the case, we're entitled to say, I think, that religious faith is surplus to requirements. Whereas, if I was to ask anyone in this room, think of a wicked thing said or an evil thing done, by a person of faith in the name of faith, no one would have a second of hesitation in thinking of one, would they? Interesting to re realize how true that is and how much truer it's getting. Does anyone ever listen to Dennis Prager's show? He's a slightly loopy uh, Christian broadcaster, um, religious broadcaster, I should say. He's, not, he's, he's more Jewish than Christian, Judeo-Christian broadcaster who quite often rather generously has me on his show, and he asked me a question the other day. He had a challenge of his own. He said, you're to imagine that you're in a town late at night where you've never been before and you have no friends and it's getting dark. And through the darkness, you see coming towards you a group of men, let's say 10. Do you feel better or worse if you know that they're just coming from a prayer meeting? This is uh, Mr. Prager's question to me. I said, well, Mr. Prager, without leaving you the, from just without quitting the letter B, I can tell you I've had that experience in Belfast, in Beirut, in Baghdad, in Bombay, in Bosnia, and in Bethlehem. And if you see anyone coming from a religious gathering in any of those places, you know exactly how fast you need to run. <clears throat> 
and no one has to explain to you why, and I haven't had to waste any time telling you, have I, ladies and gentlemen. So I submit to you that it is those who are people of faith who have the explaining to do, who have the justifying to do with, if this is indeed the case. If they can't account for anything about the origin of our cosmos or our species, if they say that without them, we'd be without morals and make us seem as if we're merely animals without faith. If further, uh, everybody, f everybody can name an instance where religion has made people actually behave worse to one another and act as a retardant upon the advances of knowledge and science and information, I submit that the case to be made uh, is theirs rather than mine. And we have a better tradition. We're not just arid secularists and materialists, we on the atheist side. We can point to the, through the Hubble telescope, the fantastic, awe-inspiring, majestic pictures that are being taken now of the outer limits of our universe. And who's going to turn away from those pictures and start gaping again at the burning bush? We have smaller microscopes that can examine for us the miracles of the interior and the double helix. And the sheer beauty of that, the natural world, is wonderful enough, more wonderful than anything conjured by the fools who believe in astrology or the supernatural. And we have a better tradition politically uh, against the popes and the, and the imams and the witch doctors and the, the divine right of kings and the whole long tradition of, of civic repression combined with religion that's known as theocracy.